Hello to all of our listeners tuning in today. I'm Laura Ruggles and you're listening to BioViews, bringing you perspectives on the life sciences across time and place. Today for our second episode, we're joined by Dr. Marta Helena, who's here to talk to us about consciousness in octopuses and encounters with minds very different from our own. My first personal encounter with an octopus off the southern coast just outside of Adelaide in South Australia was one of those moments that really stands out in memory like a photograph pinned to the wall. I'd just dived down and, following some zebrafish around a large rock, came face to face with an enormous red Maori octopus. Startled and slightly concerned, I backed off. These are some of the largest octopuses in these waters, and though it didn't seem full size, I wasn't at all sure if I'd come off well if it came to an altercation. I watched as the octopus did the same, rapidly descending to the seabed and hiding among the sea grasses, morphing its mobile body to blend in seamlessly. I could just see the large eyes following me closely as I circled above and was struck by that uncanny feeling that's been described by so many people upon encountering octopuses, that he and I were assessing one another. Twin alien intelligences, myself perhaps more alien than him, so far out of my natural habitat. Philosopher Peter Godfrey Smith writes about similar encounters of his own in his recent book, Other Minds, The Octopus and the Evolution of Intelligent Life. In this book, he looks at research into the intriguing nature of octopus minds and behaviour. Dr. Marta Helena, a lecturer in the Philosophy of Psychology and Cognitive Science at the University of Cambridge, published a paper this year entitled Octopuses as Conscious Exotica, in which she discusses this book, reflects upon octopus intelligence, and looks at how we understand and study consciousness and cognition in non-human animals. She is here today to tell us more about this. I asked her first what it is about octopuses in particular that makes them so useful for understanding how to study and think about non-human intelligence. Yeah, so octopuses are very interesting as an animal because they are thought to be quite intelligent, but their intelligence is achieved in a way that's very different from humans and other vertebrates. So octopuses fall into the class cephalopods, which are a class of mollusks, similar to snails and slugs. But unlike snails and slugs, octopuses are incredibly complex, both neurologically, so their nervous system is complex, and behaviorally. So their nervous system includes about 500 million neurons, which is comparable to many other kinds of mammals. And each of the eight arms that an octopus has has millions of receptors on it that can pick up tactile and chemical information. And they have a sophisticated visual system as well. And their behavior is also thought to be quite complex and described as intelligence. So they're described as curious, observant, flexible, good problem solvers. And so both neurologically and behaviorally considered quite complex, but their bodies and their brains are very, very different from humans and other mammals. So for example, humans have a centralized nervous system. Most of our neurons are found in our brain, but the octopus's nervous system is distributed across its whole body. So across its head and its arms. Each arm can sense independently of the head. So um, some old studies tested the abilities of amputated octopus arms, and they found that an amputated arm can still go towards and grasp food, so something desirable, and will recoil from noxious stimuli, so something that's harmful. So it's acting independently of the rest of the octopus. But yet there's also communication between the brain, as we might call it, in the head of the octopus and its arms. So it can, for example, use visual information to help an arm navigate through a maze. Uh, so that's all to say that the nervous system of an octopus is very different from that of humans and other mammals, but yet it acts in ways um, and is structured in ways that we would think leads to it being intelligent. And so it's really useful to look at as an organism because we can study how intelligence is realized in a very, very different way than it's realized in humans. Marta pointed out that not only are they structured very differently to us, they also have independent and very different evolutionary histories. 
Octopuses are useful for understanding the evolution of intelligence because they are thought to have evolved largely independently of humans and other vertebrates. So the last common ancestor of humans and octopuses is thought to be a, a very simple creature, possibly resembling a flatworm with a very simple nervous system. And that last common ancestor, so the point at which octopuses and humans diverged, is thought to be about 600 million years ago. Compare that to chimpanzees and humans who are thought to have diverged about five to seven million years ago. So octopuses and humans diverged a long time ago. So any intelligent behavior, complex cognitive abilities, complex nervous system that we see in the octopus evolved independently of the complex behavior, complex cognition and nervous system that we see in humans. And we can explore the constraints that might have led to the independent evolution of intelligence and consciousness. Due to this long history of evolutionary divergence, the lifestyle, the abilities and the body plans of octopuses are radically different from our own. Marta spoke previously about their distributed nervous systems. In fact, octopuses have more neurons in their arms than they do in their brains. She also talked about their classification as invertebrates, meaning that they have no skeletons. In aquarium context, this means octopuses are notorious escape artists, not only due to their strategic intelligence and their problem-solving skills, but assisted by almost unboundedly morphable bodies that enable them to manoeuvre through impossibly small cracks and crevices. Octopuses also have three hearts, a mobilising venom, sharp beaks, jet propulsion, and a digestive system that runs straight through the middle of their brains. Their colour-changing, contortable skin itself contains active light-sensitive cell clusters called chromatophores, enabling octopuses to sense and blend into the background with uncanny displays of colour and pattern matching that belie the fact that researchers are still debating whether or not they are in fact completely colourblind. Octopuses are also for the most part not very social creatures, and their lives usually span only a couple of years, as males die shortly after mating while the females guard the eggs until they hatch, then also perish. Despite all these differences from us that might shape the content and type of experiences they have, octopuses' evolutionary history, like ours, converged upon consciousness and intelligence. It's these kinds of features of octopuses, both alien and intelligent, that lead Marta in her paper to describe octopuses as a kind of conscious exotica. I asked her to tell us a little bit more about this. Yeah, so conscious exotica is a term that I borrowed from Murray Shanahan, who's a cognitive roboticist at Imperial College London. What he means by that term is an organism or a system that has a rich inner conscious life, so rich inner experience, but is structured and behaves in a way that's radically unlike humans. Uh, so this is something you find a lot in science fiction and literature and film, where you encounter an entity that is very human-like, so like a humanoid robot or humanoid alien, then it's quite easy to identify their experiences, or we can infer from their behavior what experiences they have. But sometimes in literature and film, we are met with an entity that is very unlike humans, so like a massive goo or a liquid, a crystalline entity. And there, it becomes much more difficult to find out whether it's intelligent, whether it's conscious, whether it experiences things, and if its experiences are like human experiences. A good example of this in a recent film is Arrival, so that's based on a short story by Ted Chang. And there we encounter this alien species called the heptapods. There are these really large creatures with seven limbs that are jointed like a spider, so unlike an octopus. They have no visible eyes or mouths, and one of the premises of the films is figuring out how to communicate with them so we can both learn about their technology but also learn what it's like to be a heptapod. And this, what it is like to be a certain type of system, is one of the ideas popularised by Thomas Nagel's famous 1974 article, What Is It Like To Be A Bat?, that people have in mind when they talk about consciousness. I asked Marta about what sorts of phenomena scientists and philosophers who analyse and study consciousness are actually looking at. Consciousness is one of these terms that's used in a variety of ways. It can mean different things to different researchers. 
broadly, researchers use it to refer to those cases where it feels like something to be a particular animal or a system. But the thing is that what it feels like to be a particular animal can vary quite a bit. So I can feel pain, I can smell something, hear something, see something. I can talk to myself, like I have an inner voice. I can imagine, remember things very vividly that have happened in the past. So all of these things would fall under this concept of consciousness. These would all be conscious experiences. So one has to be uh, quite specific by what they mean when they're trying to investigate consciousness in humans and other organisms. And the philosopher and biologist Peter Godfrey Smith likes to distinguish between consciousness and subjective experience, where subjective experience is this feeling of what it's like to be you, where it's, it's an additional question whether you have more sophisticated abilities that we might want to call conscious, like self-awareness or the ability to self-reflect. Marta also highlighted two different questions that we can ask about consciousness. The distinction between the distribution question, the phenomenological question, is um, something that Colin Allen and Michael Trussman, two philosophers, introduced, and I find it's quite useful. So the distribution question is, can we know which animals besides humans are conscious? So it's just, is a particular organism conscious or not? And then the phenomenological question is the further question of, if we think an organism is conscious, what kind of experiences does it have? So all of those potential inner experiences that one could have that I described earlier, what type would this organism have? With the distribution question, at least for philosophers and biologists like Peter Godfrey Smith, they would say, yes, we have good reason to think an octopus is conscious. What reasons do we have? Well, there are a few. Peter Godfrey Smith specifically draws on the evolution of consciousness to make an argument for octopus consciousness. So he argues that some of the conditions for the evolution of consciousness are uh, having a nervous system. And another important condition is evolving in an environment in which it's an advantage to evolve a complex active body that can quickly respond to stimuli. So the type of environment we find in the Cambrian period where you have to respond to predators and capture prey. And octopuses do have these things. They have both a complex nervous system and a complex active body. They're mobile and can respond flexibly and rapidly to different situations in the environment. So because of all of that and a few other things, we have reason to think that octopuses have some kind of minimal consciousness. And then the question of what kind of experiences they have, that becomes more complex We have reasons to think that, for example, they have what one would call primordial emotions. So they seem to have an ability to distinguish between good and bad things. So they can successfully identify conditions that are harmful to them. So if there's no food or, as I mentioned earlier, responding to noxious stimuli. And they can also identify beneficial conditions, so finding food sources, potential mates. So there's good reason to think that octopuses have evolved an ability to be able to distinguish good and bad, which we think might require some kind of primordial motions. And it's these sorts of strong preferences, combined with octopuses' intelligence, that can lead to some amusing and infuriating behaviour in captivity. For example, octopuses can actually recognise individual humans. Peter Godfrey Smith talks about an octopus in a laboratory in New Zealand that took a dislike to just one of the lab staff for no discernible reason and would shoot a targeted jet of water at the back of her neck every time she walked past. In that same lab, and in others, they've also had problems with octopuses targeting light bulbs with their water jets when nobody's around. Octopuses dislike bright lights, and these individuals seem to have figured out that doing this shorts out the power which plunges the place into darkness. This behaviour became such a problem at the New Zealand lab that the octopus in question actually had to be released back into the ocean. Octopuses are also widely known to frustrate researchers by not cooperating with experimental setups, being more curious about the apparatus than performing the set tasks, and generally making it very difficult to perform the kinds of experiments we usually use to assess the cognitive capacities of other organisms. But despite these relatable anecdotes, Marta also points out that because of major differences, like the way that language shapes our own experiences, the inner world of octopuses might be quite alien to us. 
based on the structure and function of the octopus body, we have reason to think that they lack certain other types of inner experiences that humans do have. So for example, a large part of the inner experience of humans is inner speech. So we often talk to ourselves, think about things in speech, read things in our minds. And this is thought to have come from an internalization of outward verbal speech. And octopuses lack verbal speech. They have some forms of communication, but nothing resembling language. Given this clear lack of the capacity to verbally report their experiences, I wanted to know more about some of the methodological challenges that scientists encounter when they study consciousness in non-human animals more generally. It is quite challenging to study consciousness or subjective experience in other organisms and and in humans. We don't have direct access to the inner experiences of others. We have to rely on indirect measures of conscious life. Some indirect measures might seem straightforward, like verbal reports. So when people say, I'm feeling this or I'm thinking this, but studies have showed that verbal reports aren't always reliable, that even though we might say that we're thinking or feeling something, in fact, our actions were based on something else. So even with something like verbal reports, it's not clear that it's a good measure of our conscious experiences. So that's the case with humans. And then in non-human animals, it's even more difficult because one, uh, we don't have verbal reports. And two, because their experiences and their bodies differ from humans, we have to infer based on our knowledge of their biology and the type of environment they live in, their evolutionary history, what kind of experiences they might have. So that's one problem, being able to measure or find out what a good measure is of inner experiences. But in addition to that, uh, right now we don't have a widely accepted theory of consciousness, so it's quite difficult to figure out whether non-human animals have what we would call consciousness because we're not quite sure what it looks like, even in the human case. I asked Marta about some of the more traditional philosophical challenges to studying consciousness and the ways that scientists and other theorists are moving past these. So one of the difficulties with studying consciousness has been what's been called the hard problem in philosophy and cognitive science. And the hard problem is the problem that even when we have very rich knowledge of a physical system, it's not clear how we infer from our knowledge of that physical system what the experiences of that system are. So there seems to be a gap. But scientists and philosophers have started to move past that and looked at well, what do we know about the biological and cognitive structures that lead to conscious experiences in humans and what the function of consciousness might be and developing an account of that? And once we have an account of that, we can then look at other organisms such as octopuses and see, well, do they have similar structures, analogous structures that have the functions that are required to solve the problems that we solve with conscious experience? That's an approach that's become more widespread, and it's one that I think is a good approach to take. In addition to the spread of these sorts of methodological approaches, I asked where Marta thinks the field of consciousness research is headed and what some of the future challenges might be. I think the field is headed in the direction of trying to develop a theory of consciousness that is empirically grounded, trying to account for the diversity of forms that consciousness might take. Also, not thinking of consciousness as a unified thing or as one thing, but understanding that it comes in many different forms. For example, feeling pain or being able to imagine something or having rich memories of past experiences, that all of those are different forms of consciousness that might require their own accounts in terms of their structure and function, how they operate in an organism that's one direction the field is headed. And another is to look more closely at the evolutionary history of life and try to locate consciousness within that evolutionary history to understand better what its function is for an organism in a complex environment. One of the projects that I lead at the University of Cambridge is called the Kinds of Intelligence Project, and that's with the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, the CFI, as we call it. So this center brings together academics from fields like computer science, philosophy, social science, and others. And one of the things we're interested in is the possibility for developing artificial intelligence and what kind of forms artificial intelligence might take. 
And one way to answer that question is to look at the rich forms of life and intelligence we find on Earth. Our project is very interdisciplinary, and that's quite helpful because computer scientists are drawing on neuroscience and cognitive science for developing AI. And it's very helpful to look at the methods that psychologists, neuroscientists, cognitive scientists have used to assess cognitive abilities in other organisms in order to assess cognitive abilities in artificial intelligence. There are many methodological challenges to studying consciousness in humans, in non-human animals, and in uh, potentially non-biological systems like artificial intelligence. But even though we're faced with those challenges, it's really important that we answer the question of whether a particular organism or system is conscious. And that's because we base moral and practical decisions on our answer to that question. So if we know that a particular organism feels pain in a given situation, we want to ensure that it isn't put in that situation, that it has freedom from pain. Given that, I think one of the challenges will be to know when we have enough evidence for consciousness in a particular organism or artificial system in order to take moral and practical action. These ethical dimensions to the problem of assessing consciousness, not only in other organisms but in artificial systems too, are ones that won't go away quickly and make more of this sort of research both essential and worthwhile. So thank you again, Dr. Marta Helena, for joining us on BioViews today. Thank you all for listening in too, and don't forget to tune in again next fortnight. Subscribe to our channel at bioviewspodcast.com or follow us on Twitter at bioviewshps. You can access Marta's article in the link on the blog post, and you can follow her and her research on Twitter. Her handle is at Marta Helena. Read more about the philosophy of consciousness at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy page, which I've also linked. And be sure to check out Peter Godfrey Smith's book, Other Minds, The Octopus and the Evolution of Intelligent Life, which is available by following the link below. That's all for now till our next episode. I'm your host, Laura Ruggles, and you've been listening to BioViews. Bioviews.